learners. Welcome back to our exploration of health psychology. Today, we're setting out on a journey into the complex and fascinating realm of stress. We'll unravel the intricate webs of the physiology of stress, delve into the numerous sources of stress, and illuminate the myriad ways in which we cope. So buckle up, because we're going on an enlightening journey. The concept of stress, just like its actual experience, can be a bit tricky to pin down. It's been defined in numerous ways, from being viewed as a stimulus to being classified as a response. Nowadays, we understand stress as a process. It's all about how we perceive and respond to the events that challenge us. Central to this process is the concept of appraisal. This is how we evaluate and understand stressors in our lives, and it shapes our reactions in profound ways. It has also been described as how well a person fits into their environment. And here it is whether or not you fit. And if you do, you have the amount of resources that you need, great. Then you are in a state of challenge. It is good stress. It is useful stress. But if you do not have the resources to fit your environment, well, then you're in a state of threat. And that is bad stress. And that's when we struggle in our mind and in our body. So where does stress come from? The sources are as diverse as they are numerous. Significant life events, such as marriage, moving, a loss of a loved one, can all be sources of stress. Then there are daily hassles, the small but pesky issues that wear us down over time. Work-related stressors, from tight deadlines to challenging colleagues, also play a big role. And let's not forget about social cultural factors, such as discrimination or poverty that can cause profound, chronic stress. There are also unique stressors associated with different life stages. For example, emerging adulthood, a period of life where we're not quite adolescents and not quite full-fledged adults, can bring its own set of unique stressors. We'll also talk about the long-lasting impact of adverse childhood experiences and prenatal stress which can shape our stress responses into adulthood. In contrast, social support can be a powerful buffer against stress. The emotional comfort and practical help we get from others can make a world of difference in how we handle the stress. However, even this has its own stressors. For instance, caregiving for a loved one with a chronic illness can be a significant source of stress. It's also important to note that stress isn't evenly distributed among all people. Groups like ethnic minorities, women, the poor, and immigrants often bear a heavier load of stress. Understanding these disparities is crucial for developing intervention to, tho to help those most affected. So how does our body respond to these stressors? Well, it's a complex dance involving various systems in our body. The brain and nervous system are central players, receiving and interpreting signals about stress. The endocrine system, made up of glands that produce hormones, then gets involved. These hormones act as messengers, orchestrating the body's response to stress. Two major pathways kick into gear when we're under stress. The fast-acting sympathoadrenomedullary system, or SAM axis, which involves getting epinephrine and norepinephrine as quickly as possible to your body systems in fight or flight mode. This is the sympathetic nervous system activation, which allows us to respond to acute stressors and acute threats, like being uh, attacked by a bear or running away from someone who wants to rob you or something of those along those lines. The stressor activates the medulla inside your adrenal gland, which sits on top of your kidneys. That sends out epinephrine, or sometimes referred to as adrenaline, to various organs in your body. It increases your heart and respiratory rates, 
it increases your perspiration rates and increases your blood flow to your muscles, giving them enhanced strength. It decreases systems that don't matter. So you can respond by fighting or fleeing. This is paired with the slower, more sustained hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical response or axis. This is sometimes referred to as the HPA axis. Now, on the outside of the adrenal glands is the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex produces what are called corticosteroids. Those corticosteroids go to various parts of your body to change your metabolism, to deal with longer term or chronic stressors like wintertime or famine so that you may sustain yourself through those longer stressor periods. The HPA axis is activated when long-term stress is appraised by your brain. That changes the way your body responds. One of the more famous corticosteroids is cortisol. And cortisol is released when there is a perceived long-term stressor. Both of these pathways have its unique role in helping us cope with stress. In a later video, we'll explore what is called psychoneuroimmunology, or PNI, where we discuss how these two systems, or these two axes, impact our immune system, and more specifically, the chronic stress response, or the HPA axis, increasing our risk for illness. This PNI explores the link between stress, the nervous system, and the immune system. So stay tuned for that video. Stress responses aren't uniform across all individuals. There's quite a bit of variation. For instance, Shelley Taylor and her colleagues proposed the tend and befriend model. This model suggests that when faced with stress, women may be more likely to protect their offspring, the tend part, and seek social support, the befriend part. This model suggests that women and men might react differently to stressors differently due to evolutionary pressures and how humans divided labor in the past. Now, measuring stress is also a critical part of stress research. Traditional self-report methods have been widely used, but they come with their limitations. For instance, people might not accurately remember their stress levels or they might be influenced by social desirability. Newer models and methods like Ecological Momentary Assessment, or EMA, are now being used to overcome some of these limitations. EMA involves repeated sampling of a person's behaviors and experiences in real time in their natural environments. This allows us to capture more accurate, nuanced data about their stress levels. The other thing that I wanna point out here is using hormones and physiological research to enhance. So let's go back to Shelley Taylor and her tendon befriend model. So we said evolutionary pressures might be the reason for this difference in men and women, but it could also be a difference in oxytocin levels. This is a hormone that increases our bonding with other individuals. It allows us to feel safe and calm when we're around loved individuals. That research is used by taking saliva samples, cheek swabs, all different kinds of physiological measurement so we can have a better understanding of what the physiology of the body is doing when we make psychological theories. So let's better understand stress in general. Let's explore a few seminal models of stress and illness. We just talked about the tendon befriend model, but let's go back a little bit to Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome, or GAS. He proposed that our bodies go through three stages in response to stress. An initial alarm reaction, where we mobilize responses to deal with the threat. A stage of resistance, where our body tries to adapt to the stressor using the SAM axis or the HPA axis. 
And finally, a stage of exhaustion when the body's resources are depleted. This can lead to illness or even death if the stress is intense and prolonged. Next, we have Richard Lazarus's, as well as Folkman's, transactional model. This model is currently the dominant framework in stress research. It emphasizes the role of cognitive appraisal in stress. I mentioned that at the beginning of the video. That is, it's not just the situation itself that determines stress, but how we interpret and then cope with that interpretation. According to this model, our thoughts and interpretations of a situation play a crucial role in determining whether we experience it as stressful or not. Last, we'll discuss the diathesis stress model. This model suggests that some people are more vulnerable to stress-related illnesses due to predisposing factors. These factors can be genetic, biological in nature, or purely environmental. This model helps us understand why some people are more prone to conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, after experiencing traumatic events. For instance, someone with a genetic vulnerability to anxiety might be more likely to develop PTSD after a traumatic event than someone without this vulnerability. It's also worth noting the minority stress theory, which is a newer theory. It proposes that stress and the consequences of stress impact minority groups at greater rates due to the hostility and discrimination they frequently encounter. This theory underscores the importance of considering societal factors in our understanding of stress and health. It reminds us that stress is not just a personal experience, but also a societal and systemic one. From the complex web of physiological responses to the myriad sources and models of stress, our explanation today has shown that stress is a multifaceted phenomenon with far-reaching effects on health and our well-being. But remember, this is just one piece of the puzzle. Next, we'll see how we cope with stress, explore different coping strategies, and examine how effective they are in mitigating the effects of stress. So let's delve into the fascinating world of personal factors that affect our ability to handle stress. Did you know that we all have different ways of coping with stress? Indeed, these coping strategies can be broadly categorized into two types problem-focused, and emotion-focused strategies. You may wonder which strategy is more effective and more adaptive. Well, it depends on several factors, one of which is the controllability of the stressor. Ever heard of the emotion cascade model? This model suggests that focusing on our emotional reaction to stress might actually exacerbate the situation. But here's the interesting part. Emotional approach to coping, or EAC, is actually more adaptive and more helpful in most situations. Now let's talk about the impact of our dispositional affect and degree of optimism on our coping strategies. People with positive affectivity, those who are happy, cheerful, optimistic, and energetic, tend to develop better coping skills and experience better health outcomes compared to those with negative affectivity. Similarly, optimistic people and those who feel in control of their lives generally adopt more effective coping responses compared to those who exhibit pessimism or low perceived control. And let's not forget about resilience. Resilient individuals are less likely to be overwhelmed by stressful situations, which can make them healthier in the long run. Moving on, let's consider the external factors that affect our ability to cope. Socioeconomic status is one of the most influential external factors. It has been consistently found to be a significant predictor of both health and health behaviors. Why? More money means more access to health resources. More access to health resources means healthier bodies and time for other activities for our mental health our spiritual health, our social health, etc. Another important external factor that I mentioned 
in the earlier part of this video is social support. Studies have shown that social support not only helps people cope more effectively, but it also enhances the body's response to stress. How? Well, one leading hypothesis that I mentioned earlier is the buffering hypothesis, that social support is a stand-in or a stand-between for the effects of the stressor. There's also the direct effect hypothesis where the person getting the social support is benefiting from that by taking away the effects of the stressor directly. All right, so how do we manage stress? There are various approaches, starting with relaxation therapies. Techniques like progressive muscle relaxation, the relaxation response, diaphragmatic breathing relaxation, they can all improve our psychological and physiological response to stress. Mindfulness training interventions, such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, can also be beneficial. These interventions have been shown to reduce stress improve quality of life, and even boost the functioning of our immune systems. And then there are cognitive therapies, which aim to break the cycle of irrational thought patterns. These patterns can distort our perception of everyday events and prevent us from adopting healthy coping behaviors. One such therapy is cognitive behavioral stress management, a multimodal therapy that equips people with coping strategies to deal with stressors before they become overwhelming. Techniques that promote emotional disclosures, such as expressive writing, can also be helpful in managing stress. Dear Diary, it was a stressful day today. But stress management isn't just about therapies and interventions. There are other tools and techniques associated with effective coping and positive health outcomes. These include maintaining a grateful outlook on life, having a gratitude journal, having a sense of humor, and consuming humorous things or things that you find funny. I cannot tell you how much laughing works as a stress response, and it's also an aerobic activity. Owning a pet, of course, these pets have to bring you joy, not just be a chore, of course. And they can be dogs, they can be cats, they can be gerbils, they can be snakes, they can be fish. Whatever brings you joy has to work. And incorporating spirituality in your life. And I don't mean just religion in your life, but really connecting yourself with nature and that there is a commonality shared with all life that kind of spirituality. Now, the bad news is, is that stress is a part of life. But the good news is, with the right tools and understanding, we can navigate it more effectively. So remember, whether it's about fostering a positive mindset, surrounding yourself with supportive people, or practicing relaxation therapies and mindfulness, your journey to managing stress as unique as you are. So stay positive, stay resilient, take care of yourself.